Um, so welcome to all of you and welcome to this anniversary celebration of the Institute for Advanced Study. I'm Edward Witten in the School of Natural Sciences and it's great that so many uh, old friends and colleagues have been able to come from many different places and also to see so many of you from locally. So our speakers this afternoon are the two most recent faculty appointments in the school in physics and astronomy. So you'll hear more about Matthias Zadriaga later, but I'll be introducing our first speaker, Nima Arkani Hamed. Nima received his PhD at Berkeley in 1997. He actually already became famous as a graduate student for his work on the possibility that the universe might have extra dimensions large enough to be detected at accelerators beyond the three space and one time dimension that we see in ordinary life. After postdoctoral work at SLAC and at, uh, being on the faculty of Berkeley, he was appointed professor of physics at Harvard in 2002, and he's been a professor in the School of Natural Sciences here at the Institute since 2007. His awards include the Grivlov Medal and the Sackler Prize. He's brought to the Institute an immensely fertile imagination and a wide range of interests. He has reinvigorated our efforts at understanding collider physics. He's brought a lot of new ideas on dark matter, uh, symmetry breaking, supersymmetry, how it might be realized in nature. Most recently, he's introduced a lot of exciting new ideas on a, a very rich topic that spans many of his interests from collider physics to string theory, the topic being uh, scattering amplitudes in gauge theory. But I think I'll turn over the floor now to Nima. I would also like to uh, welcome all of you uh, here to what uh, promises to be um, a uh, very festive uh, occasion, <coughs> and um, uh, I want to be—I want to tell you about um, at least uh, uh, where I think fundamental physics is, is going. If not in the 21st century, then in the next few years. <laughs> um, uh, and so the plan for the talk is uh, to first set the stage. If we're going to talk about uh, the 21st century, um, uh, it's worth spending a, a few minutes recapping at least some of the most important things that we learned in the 20th century that we are trying to uh, build off of. And it, at a very, very broad brush level, um, the, uh, 20th, the uh, 20th century was all about the twin revolutions of relativity and quantum mechanics and figuring out how to put them together and understanding that, that, that uh, the way they are put together uh, it is, gives rise to an amazingly rich, complex, diverse, interesting set of phenomenon that seem to be able to describe almost everything uh, we see in the world around us. And of course, we're interested in the things that it might not be able to explain, but also in further uh, understanding and uh, uncovering this very, very rich structure. Then I want to tell you about uh, at least two of uh, what seem to be very central mysteries uh, uh, in our understanding of, uh, of nature today. Uh, one of them has to do with the very basic fact that uh, that uh, the very arena of physics, um, talking about things happening in space and time, uh, the idea of space-time just cannot survive fundamentally um, and has to be replaced by something else. Space-time is, is almost certainly an approximate notion and it's a very, very big question to figure out uh, what replaces it. It's a very big question because by dooming space-time you are removing, apparently, the arena in which physics normally happens. Uh, and a, a second set of questions, um, and, and these, may, these may well be tied to each other, uh, but a second set of questions has to do with another incredibly basic feature about the world, that despite the fact that it's governed by microscopic laws, microscopic quantum mechanical laws, um, we have a macroscopic universe. We have a big universe. It's one of the most salient facts about the world that it's big. And it turns out to be extremely hard in our current understanding of physics, just taking the laws that we know and love, to come up with a good explanation for why the universe is macroscopic. So um, that's another very basic question that uh, should have a good answer that we don't have a good answer to right now, and which fuels a lot of the current research. So I want to tell you about these questions and about some of the ideas uh, uh, associated with them. And uh, you know, these questions have been around and people have been thinking about them and there's been various degrees of excitement associated with them for the past 20 or 30 years. Uh, what's really particularly special about this epoch um, is, and especially this decade, is that uh, a, a hopefully new golden age of experiments is uh, upon us that should give us 
uh, a lot of new data that uh, uh, direct hints from nature that we haven't had uh, for a long time. And I'm talking about um, uh, most particularly in, and uh, uh, with at least the most potential is the Large Hadron Collider, but also there's a slew of experiments uh, uh, to try to detect uh, dark matter and a whole set of things about cosmology that I will, uh, which are incredibly exciting, but which I will leave for uh, Matthias to describe since he'll be talking about cosmology. Okay, so just to give a, uh, an idea of the kind of length scales that uh, we think about in the subject, here's a very, very broad brush um, a picture of the various distance scales we uh, think about in uh, nature. Here is the size of the universe around the Hubble scale, 10 to the 28 centimeters. That's on the large end of what we've actually also experimentally probed. Um, on the tiniest end of what we've probed is another length scale that, as we'll talk about in a bit, is actually an important invariant length scale that exists in nature. People have known about this length scale for 70 years. They knew that there was something going on at this distance of around 10 to the minus 17 centimeters. It's called the weak scale, the weak length scale. So this is where we're about to go to with the LHC. Okay? So that, that 10 to the minus 17 centimeters is around 1,000 times smaller than the atom, 1,000 uh, times smaller than the nucleus, around a billion times smaller than the atom. Um, okay, this is a gargantuan length scale. Um, and so anyway, th 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 between these two lines is the boundary of what we understand, of, of what we've seen, uh, or, or what we're probing experimentally. There's a much, much, much tinier length scale, of the Planck length, around 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, um, which we'll also uh, talk about. But one way of characterizing it is if you, if you just ask, if you, take, uh, if, you take, uh, if you take the force between two electrons, at very large distances, that force, uh, the gravitational attraction between them is 42 orders of magnitude weaker than the electrical repulsion between them. But if you really take those electrons and force them to get closer and closer and closer to each other, um, uh, at some point the gravitational force between them starts growing uh, in comparison to the electric force. Uh, and eventually at this distance around 10 to the minus 33 centimeters is when, when they all start becoming uh, comparable. Um, so this is a length scale associated with gravity. The fact that it's a number that's so tiny as a length compared to all the other numbers is a reflection of the great weakness of gravity uh, compared to all the other uh, interactions. Uh, but but uh, it, it's at this length scale that, that we suspect that all sorts of puzzles and paradoxes associated with saying the words gravity and quantum mechanics together uh, kick in and make an appearance. It's arguments around this length scale that suggest that space-time doesn't make sense. We have to replace it with something else and so on. So, these are sort of three interesting scales that we, uh, that, that we think a lot about, uh, a, a lot about in, in this business. So, as I said, the, one, the first set of puzzles that I'll be talking about after review have to do with what's going on up here. And the second set of puzzles has to do with an incredibly obvious feature of this picture, which is that there are these incredible gaps. That the, this weak length scale is 16 orders of magnitude bigger than as a length scale than the Planck scale. The universe is gargantuan compared to either one of these scales. So these enormous hierarchies. And you might think that this is not so hard to explain. You know, atoms are small and elephants are big, but we don't think of this as a central uh, mystery of modern physics. But it turns out this, act, this one actually is. It's very, very difficult to understand why there's a big macroscopic universe for reasons that I'll discuss. And even, uh, and, uh, and, and coming up with an answer to it's such an incredibly basic question seems to, uh, seems to uh, involve a real set of uh, puzzles and, and paradoxes in our, in our current thinking that requires something beyond what we now have. Okay, so here's uh, the uh, lightning review of the last, uh, of the last century. Um, and um, so uh, we started off with uh, special relativity. Um, I mean, uh, there's a common theme, not only in what happened in the last 100 years, but going all the way back to Newton, and continuing to now, that as we learn more and more about nature, we find that different things, um, seemingly different phenomena, seem to be uh, different aspects of a, more, uh, of a more unified whole. And when that more unified whole is appreciated, other phenomena are predicted, which are not obviously related to either one of the first two, but which are nonetheless, uh, uh, nonetheless true and give us a deeper understanding of what's going on. So special relativity unified space and time. Just like we can rotate uh, space coordinates into each other by doing rotations in space, it's also possible to mix space and time coordinates with each other simply by uh, uh, moving at different uh, fixed, fixed velocities. 
So that's unification of space and time, the fact that they could be mixed with each other, the fact that there are different aspects of the same thing, uh, was itself a, a remarkable, just kinematical fact about the world, and also unified many other things, energy and mass, electricity and magnetism. It gave, it gave rise to a, to, a, to, a, to a uniform explanation for many, many, many other things. The idea of general relativity was that space-time itself could be, uh, wasn't, uh, wasn't a static arena, but could be curved. The curvature was asso associated with, the, with gravity. And again, this idea that it could be curved had other consequences that were unanticipated. For example, when we talk about the expanding universe, to even talk about the expanding universe, it doesn't make any sense to talk about uh, an expanding universe. It's not expanding into anything. It's just getting bigger. There's more and more space that's being invented all the time as the universe expands. Uh, and that's not even something you can talk about if you have the standard uh, arena in which everything happens, picture of what space-time is. You know, when we say the universe is, is, is expanding, we imagine there's two galaxies here. Later, the universe is bigger. It's bigger because there's more space invented between the galaxies. Uh, and that's only possible because uh, space-time is really something dynamical. So again, not only did it explain uh, things that were known already, but it predicted other things that were really not obviously connected uh, to them. And uh, um, of course, another interesting theme that would make for a whole other talk is that often these predictions are so surprising that even the people who invent the theories refuse to really make them. So, uh, but, uh, th th and th this was certainly what one, one of the examples. We'll talk about another one in a second. This was such a surprisingly dramatic prediction that Einstein refused to make it. But it's really a basically inevitable consequence of his theory. So quantum mechanics unified, uh, amongst other things, uh, waves and particles. So there's no such thing as waves anymore. Everything in nature is a particle, but they're not classical particles, they're quantum particles. And sometimes large macroscopic collections of quantum particles behave as classical particles. And sometimes large macroscopic collections of quantum particles behave as classical waves. But there's just one underlying concept, that of a particle, which again, in various approximations, uh, led to the uh, diver the, the diversity of phenomena that were seen in the classical world. And uh, as, as amazing a development as relativity was, quantum mechanics is even more revolutionary. Um, it completely changed 